Well, welcome everyone. I'm real excited about starting this new study series on the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter one, verse three says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and guard what is written in it for the time is near. The book of Revelation is one of the most mysterious and exciting books of the Bible, yet because of the symbology, it can be confusing. It's confusing at times to new and old believers alike. No matter what challenges we encounter with understanding some aspects of Revelation, we must never forget that this is the only book that says a person will be blessed by reading, by hearing the words of this prophecy, and by guarding its written words. Remember, Yahushua has proposed to us, and we have accepted his proposal. The marriage supper of the Lamb is set. Our wedding day is approaching. It is marked on Yahuwah's calendar. And that is why his feast days are so important. The book of Revelation was written by the disciple that Yahushua loved, John. Now, he is not to be confused with John the Immerser or John the Baptist. This John, John the Revelator, also wrote the Gospel of John the book of uh, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. At the time of the revelation, John had been exiled to the Isle of Patmos as a political prisoner, and this writing is said to have been done around 95 AD. We will see Yahushua, like King David, in all three roles as prophet, priest, and king. He foretold many prophecies inclusive of his crucifixion as the sacrificial lamb of Elohim and death, burial, resurrection. He reigns right now as our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he is seated at the right hand of the father he was born king and will come again as king of kings. The lion of the tribe of Judah is another description. We will see references to each of these roles in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, as well as Daniel that we've studied previously, is preparing us for the reset. And the question is, are we ready? Are we ready to be those participants in the unfolding of the last seven prophetic years leading to ultimate <laughs> jubilee? The word revelation means a disclosure or a manifestation of what is to come. What was once veiled as we saw in the book of Daniel is unveiled in Revelation. But if it is unveiled, why does it seem like it's still veiled by the symbolism? We need to remember Proverbs 25, 2. It is the glory of Yahuwah to conceal a matter, but the glory of a king is to search out a matter. Who ultimately controls the calendar and times? In Daniel chapter 2, verse 20, we read, Daniel responded and said, Blessed be the name of Eloah forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he, he changes the times and the seasons. He removes sovereigns and raises up sovereigns. He gives wisdom to the wise 
and knowledge to those who possess understanding. However, we also read in the book of Daniel in chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, and the ten horns are ten sovereigns from this reign. They shall rise, and another shall rise after them. And it is different from the first ones, and it humbles three sovereigns. And it speaks words against the Most High, and it wears out the set-apart ones of the Most High, and it intends to change appointed times and law, and they are given into its hand for a time and times and a half a time. We must be very much aware that the Revelation 17 beast is preparing for the Great Reset. Matter of fact, They've named their project the Great Reset. And how many sections do we see on this color wheel? Oh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ah, the enemy always counterfeits. So let's kind of look at some of the things that the Revelation 17 beast is preparing. Um, top left, shaping economic recovery. Oh, they're going to do that through taxation, artificial intelligence, drones, quantum computing, vaccination, future of computing, digital transformation of business, internet governance. How about redesigning social contracts, skills, and jobs to the right? Inclusive design, whatever that means, peace and resilience, whatever that means, systematic racism, human rights, justice and law, gender parity, fourth industrial revolution, LGBTI inclusion, also restoring the health of the environment, civic participation, forests, green new deals, future of mobility, future of energy, the ocean, advanced manufacturing and production, air pollution, developing sustainable business models, future of food, Batteries, corporate governance, 3, 3D printing, environmental and natural resource security, plastics and the environment, circular economy, leadership in the fourth industrial revolution. How about over here, harnessing the fourth industrial revolution, future of media, entertainment and culture, digital economy and new value creation, 5G, blockchain, digital identity, Banking and capital markets, COVID-19, which also stands for Certificate of Vaccination ID, Future of Health and Health Care, Strengthening Regional Development, Climate Change, Biodiversity, Public Finance and Social Protection, Development Finance, Aviation, Travel and Tourism. How is that going to change? International trade and investment, sustainable development, cities and urbanization, in revitalization of global cooperation, global governance, international security, global risk, agile governance, future of economic progress, geoeconomics, global health, workforce and employment. So the Revelation 17 beast is preparing for the Great Reset. In Revelation 17, verse 3, we read, And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast covered with names of blasphemy, having seven heads, and ten horns. So we know in the end of days the beast man is rising, but also Israel is rising. Yahweh's firstborn. In this excerpt from this article, it said, however, this vision of global change is not all good. 
On October 25th, 2020, the Archbishop of Upiana, Carlo Maria Vigano, sent an open letter to US President Trump warning him of the dangers of the Great Reset Initiative. Vigano said in his letter, a global plan called the Great Reset is underway. Its architect is a global elite that wants to subdue all humanity, imposing coercive measures with which to drastically limit individual freedoms and those of entire populations. In several nations, this plan has already been approved and financed. In others, it is still in the early stage behind the world leaders who are the accomplices and executors of this infernal project. There are unscrupulous characters who finance the World Economic Forum and Event 201 promoting their agenda. Each day, we are amid spiritual warfare between good and evil. Like with any military operation, strategies need to be cloaked with code language. Otherwise, this very book, this revelation message, nor John the Revelator may have ever made it off the Isle of Patmos. Roman soldiers reading his writings of the book of Revelation would simply think he has lost it. Yahushua spoke to his people in parables so they would receive and understand the message, yet the enemy and his minions would not, or at least not completely. The gospel message is even written in the heavens displayed by the constellations or the Maseroth. There is a woman, a virgin. There is a lion such as a lion of Judah. There is a serpent or a dragon like Satan. Now, most people in John's day understood more about the heavenly lights than actually we do. We could really gain a lot of education by, by looking up in the heavenly stars and constellations. However, there are gifted believers and astronomers that have correlated these signs to the Bible. The study of astronomy is not to be confused with the occult practices of astrology. SA-10 or Satan always usurps things created by Yahuwah that are meant for good and twist them into counterfeit perversions. Now, here we have a map to the left, and here is the Isle of Patmos, where John the Revelator was exiled to. John's immediate audience may have more easily understood the symbology in Revelation. In addition, upon his immediate release from Patmos, John could have deciphered the language to those he gave the book of Revelation to. I mean, after all, he was there and he brought the book of Revelation with him. So he was there among these seven assemblies. It is believed that John was released from Patmos by the successor of the Roman emperor Domitian after his death. It is thought that John lived his last days in Ephesus. And Ephesus is right here. Uh, let me get my pointer. here, number one. This would make huge sense in being able to deliver this prophetic message to the seven assemblies, which were actual assemblies in his day, but they also correlate to us in our day. So this had here and now significance for John's generation, but also prophetic significance for us. Here you also see that the present day area is Turkey. Now what is interesting that I always notice every time I look at these scriptures and look at the seven assemblies is that 
the the shape is shaped like a shepherd's staff and I always have to point that out because I just think that's pretty cool. So we have Ephesus, we have Smyrna, third Pergamus, fourth Thyatira, fifth Sardis, sixth Philadelphia, seven Laodicea. When studying the book of Revelation, one can easily see that it incorporates many of the Old and New Testament prophetic books, the writings and various scriptures within the New Testament. Therefore, whenever possible, we will gain further insight through cross-referencing scripture throughout his word, letting scripture interpret scripture. So why do some avoid the book of Revelation? I know I used to find it very difficult and intimidating to read and study. And it can be that way. But the more you read it, the more you're blessed. So, so why do some avoid the book of Revelation? because they may find it confusing. They may find it negative, maybe too hard to understand because of the symbolism. And some even believe it has already been fulfilled. There are five main viewpoints of those that study the book of Revelation. And there are more, but I'm just gonna hit on five. The preterist interpretation, the historical, the allegorical, the amillennial, and the futuristic. The preterist interpretation believes prophetic events were fulfilled in the first century. Historical interpretation believe prophetic events have been fulfilled throughout history. Now, take it, I mean, some prophetic events have been fulfilled, but we also know that in the Bible, that prophecies many times have two to three fulfillments, those in the ancient writings and, and those in the times period of the gospel messages and, and for the end of days. Allegorical interpretation believe events are just all allegorical stories, just a battle between good and evil. A millennial interpretation Revelation is just seven phases of church history, meaning no millennium or no 1,000 year reign. And then the futuristic interpretation, chapters four through 22 are in the future, the time of the tribulation. Revelation one as is viewed as pretty much having been past Revelation 2 and 3, this, this was speaking to John's prophetic present period of time, and but it also has future application. And Revelation chapter 4 through 22 is futuristic time of tribulation and more. We will be taking the futuristic approach in this Revelation study. Why? Because the reason is that the cataclysmic judgments found in Revelation simply have never happened before in history, and Satan is definitely not bound. I also hold the view that the return of Yahusha is literal. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So we should humbly submit ourselves to Yahuwah, ask for his wisdom, be willing to listen to one another, hear what each one has to say, what, what Yah has placed on their heart, bring it to the table, be able to discuss it and move forward and be stronger for it. Now, I came across Dr. Gavin Finley just 24 hours ago, and 
I found his work very informative. And he is one of the few teachers that I have come across that had that could give insights to what we studied in the closing chapters of Daniel about the timelines, about the jubilees, about how to count prophetic calendars and so forth and so on. So I value his work. Now, as we look at some of these clips, please understand that we may not all agree with everything that he says. And if he was on this presentation with us, he may not agree with everything we have to say. But let's glean wisdom from the body of believers because time is short. And Yahweh's purpose of bringing the body together is that we must rely first and foremost on his Ruach HaKadosh to lead us to all truth and stay in his word. But he wants us to come together and break bread together and search the scriptures and find truth. Search out those matters. So let's take a listen to this video. Okay, back to the main story. Uh, basically, um, the prophecy of the 70 weeks is, is going to open up a huge amount of wonderful information for us. First of all, it's going to reveal the fact that Messiah comes to us in two presentations of himself, first as the suffering servant, and secondly as the conquering king. Uh, he comes um, in those two offices, um, which we'll talk about shortly. And there is a gap between the two, and the preterists the, do not want you to accept that there is a gap. But what if Messiah died? What if he was cut off? Would that, would that be sufficient for a gap? So um, this is what we started out with, the seven-year tribulation. And when um, I came to the States uh, way back in the 70s, there were people talking about the future seven, 70th um, week and this final seven-year tribulation. So that was a good start because it was Sir Robert Anderson that gave us the opportunity to know that there was a future 70th week. And that's what we're going to talk about today. His, we're going to go through his uh, the, the NASA moon phase data rather quickly. I'm going to show you how to, to correct, create your own Hebrew calendar and have it right most of the time so that you can be fully informed about these things and be assured that what you're being told is correct. Um, and then you'll end up with something like this. And uh, we won't be able to show the basis for all these things today, but tomorrow the fall feasts are there, the Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, and the Day of Atonement. We're going to find out that they bracket the final seven years of the age very, very wonderfully. And um, we've got an error factor of uh, four-figure error factor of 99.99%. That's pretty pretty darn good. And even better than that when we deal with um, the uh, 69 weeks, which we will shortly. It's important to appreciate that the 70 weeks prophecy came to us out of a prayer. And there's a whole lot of information in the prayer as well as the details, of the, the technical details of what's been shown Um God um, is a forgiving God. And so the, the issue is that Daniel knew God is a harsh, true, righteous God. But even though he's given a rough rap about all the rough things that are happening, he still comes back and he says, yes, but we know that beyond all this, there's a merciful heart in, 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 in your character. And he doesn't let go of his God. And that's an important lesson for us because tough times are coming and a lot of people are going to let go of their God. And so we're going to, we need to know that behind it all, there's a, a loving God who's waiting for his people to come home in both houses. So, so here we have uh, Daniel. He says, yes, all Israel have transgressed thy law. He says, all Israel. So Doug was saying, that he, he go, goes through the whole Bible for, for a whole lot of his life. And then finally he starts to realize that there's two houses. And so... We're going to see that there's mention of two houses here inside the Daniel, um, uh, Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. Um, they All Israel have transgressed our law even by departing. So the word departing there is interesting. And that doesn't necessarily, um, um, uh, the prophecy is not, is not exhausted by a moral departing. How about a physical walkout? Well, there's your physical walkout right there. And that's what Daniel's referring to. He's referring to the time when the 
when the house of Israel walked out on the Jewish house and said, up yours, David, and basically cursed David and walked out. This is a huge issue, and nobody wants to talk about this. It's, um, it's not anything that uh, um, the people who want to unhitch the Old Testament, they don't want this information to go to you guys because it's got critical information for you to be powerful in the latter days and see the greater works and move on to do the glories. So Daniel's talking about, Lord, forgive. So there's nothing wrong with asking for forgiveness. Nothing wrong at all. And he's mentioning the two elements here. And the rest of this presentation, blue will be relating to the house of Judah, the royal Jewish house, which relates to God's law, the scepter, the king, and then the congregation here, the people. You start to see that in the scriptures. It'll start to pop out at you. So he's praying for the city and the people. And while he's speaking, praying, as soon as the prayer went and reached the throne of heaven, the answer was given. So it's not as if God is sitting there twiddling his thumbs, waiting to say, oh, I'm waiting for my time. He responds immediately. The question is, how quickly are we able to receive the answer? Um, Ola was talking about that in the previous, previous uh, presentation. So he's mentioning the sin of my people Israel and before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. So when he's talking about a mountain, he's talking about a nation. So here again, he's talking about a people, a congregation, and he's talking about a nation. So there's your two handles on God's covenant people, um, which you'll see all through the scriptures, the two witnesses, the two angels over the Ark of the Covenant, the two uh, candles at the ladies light um, at Sabbath, um, um, the two olive trees, on and on and on it goes. The answer comes and God answers in relationship to the specific details that Daniel's talking about. 70 weeks are determined, cut out of time upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So how much clearer could it get? He's talking about the two handles that God has on his covenant people, a nation and a congregation. And here we have the same situation going back to Abraham's uh, promise, the Abrahamic covenant, unconditional covenant. God says, I'm going to do this. He carried Abraham through the blood. Kingdom and a priesthood, a holy city and a holy people, a nation and a congregation, all wrapped up in the Abrahamic covenant which we are partakers of right now. And don't let any man or devil tell you otherwise. I don't care if it's in the Old Testament. You want to unhitch it, it can be rehitched real quickly. And you guys are just the people to do it. So to achieve what? What's the, what's the purpose? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation. There's atonement. So there is your Yom Kippur. That's your final wrap-up. That's your final reconciliation, your final day of accounting, day of uh, pardoning, day of sentencing. It's judgment day, and, and this is obviously related to the close of the age. So, Okay. So he, he reviewed several things that were interested, interesting in that short clip. The timelines that he he showed do have a seven year time span. And he sees that as the last seven years, the 70th week. And so he had it divided up into 1260 and 1260. Now, one thing he does that I personally don't do uh, is put the 1290 on the, the, last half and lets it extend 30 days beyond the 2,520 days. Um, personally, I've just taken the approach as keeping within the seven year time period of 2,520 days, but I'm open to listening to what others have discovered. 
And he also affirmed Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is being affirmed over and over again that that is the final day of judgment. So that gives us an anchor Moedim for the last seven years. At least we know where that anchor date is, that anchor Moedim is in the last seven year prophetic timeline. Yahushua told us in John 14 verse three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I shall come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you might be too. So we never, ever need to lose sight that Yahuwah is in full, absolutely full and total control. Nothing, nothing catches him off guard. Absolutely nothing. We also know that he is coming in like manner as those that witnessed how he went up in Acts 10, Acts chapter 1, excuse me, verse 10 through 11. And as they were gazing into the heaven, as he went up, see, two men stood by them dressed in white, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the heaven? This same Yahushua, who was taken up from you into the heaven, shall come in the same way as you saw him go into the heaven. And when he comes, <laughs> he's going to come in all of his glory. He will be unmistakable. In the book of Jude, which is only one chapter, but in verse 14, we read, And Enoch, the seventh from Adam, also prophesied of these, saying, See, Yahuwah comes with his myriads of set-apart ones to execute judgment on all, to punish all who are wicked among them concerning all their wicked works, which they have committed in a wicked way, and concerning all the harsh words which wicked sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, who walk according to their own lusts, and their mouth speaks proudly, admiring faces of others for the sake of gain. So we must never forget Yahuwah's in total control. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, we read, This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the command by the word of the set-apart ones, so that the living know, so that the living know that the Most High is ruler in the reign of men and gives it to whomever he wishes and sets over it the lowest of men. Now, when we studied the book of Daniel, we looked at time periods and timelines. And I went through and I marked all the chapter and verses. So if you want to take a picture with your phone to review those later, um, please do. But we studied about 10 days, 21 days, 30 days, 2300 days, 1290 1335, three weeks, 70 weeks, 12 months, three years, 70 years, seven times, a time, time, and a half a time. And in Revelation, if you look at the white print, we're going to hear timelines and time periods of, of like a thousand years or 42 months or five months, 1260 days, 10 days, three and a half days, one day, one hour half an hour, a time, times, and a half. And then also the timelines and time periods in Daniel will also play out many times in the book of Revelation, such as 2,300 days, 
1290 days, 1335 days, 70 weeks, seven times, and 10 days. So with the time and times and half a time, we see that equates to the 42 months or the 1260 days. And um, it may even equate to the three and a half days. Some view that as three and a half years. That's why I put a question mark because some view that differently. And as well, the same phraseology, if you will, a time, times, and a half a time are also mentioned in Revelation 12, 14. Now we're about to look at what Gavin Finley calls the two Rosetta Stones in Holy Scripture, the biblical month and the biblical year. He's going to reference Genesis chapter seven and eight, showing the biblical month, five months equal um, 30 days each, he'll show that. And also three and a half years equaling 1,260 days. So let's take a listen. There are two, we can, we can consider that these two um, scriptures in Genesis and in Revelation that give us an idea of the biblical month and the biblical year. They're a bit like the Rosetta Stone discovered by the French uh, in Alexandria. Um, uh, they found the stone and, and they found that it was written in three different languages so they could, they could then understand um, the hieroglyphics of, uh, of the Egyptians. So we read in Genesis 7 that in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, 17th day of the month, um, the founds of the deep were broken up. On the same day, Noah and his family entered the ark, and the Lord shut him in. So God shut him in. He didn't shut the door. God, God is responsible for judgment, not us. So keep that in mind. So here we have 150 days, and uh, the terminus of the um, time when the ark rested was on the 17th day of the seventh month. So there's five months, and we're told that it's 150 days. We do the math. I mean, this is something that a sixth grader can do, right? Um, not very complicated. And we end up with a 30-day biblical or prophetic month. So Now we turn to the second Rosetta Stone for biblical time in Revelation 12, 6 and 12, 14, the, the exile of the woman of wonder. Um, both verses describe the same event. And uh, so um, here we find out that 1260 days equals time, times and a half a time, rather cryptic, cryptically presented to us as three and a half years. So we do the math there. And we end up with um, a 360-day year. Uh, 1260 days, 3.5 years, 360-day year, prophetic year. That's what Sir Robert Anderson used to crack the case of the 70 weeks prophecy. And all the tumblers in the lock come together and they reconcile all seven verses for the final three and a half years. 42 months equals three and a half years equals 1260 days. God's laid it out for us to discover. Study to show yourself approved under God. You find out all sorts of interesting things, you know? So here's our seven verses again. And um, these two relate to the exile, exile of the woman. And all of these can be reconciled very beautifully. And here we have um, this great dramatic story, which was probably talked about by the shepherds in the field when they looked up at the stars. And they, they um, the patriarchs probably talked about it too. Maybe Adam knew about all these things. The, uh, the, the ancient patriarchs knew. That's Andromeda on the right. Uh, and um, she's going to be delivered, but she's having a bit of a rough time in in the uh, in the interim. She's being more or less surrounded by the dragon. It's a story of the latter days. Now, is she doomed? Is it all is all lost? Is it all terrible? Um, 
with no hope, um, no reconciliation, no mercy of God. Um, well, there's a deliverance, you know. Um, with Andromeda, she's delivered eventually, and gloriously so. And in Micah chapter 2, she's delivered too. The breaker comes. Okay. So um, with these timelines, we see that prophetic timelines, and this is... This has really been an amazing journey as we've studied the timelines in Daniel and we've tried to get our head wrapped around this 360 day prophetic calendar. The 360 day prophetic calendar, it goes with Yahweh's prophetic timelines. Okay, so the prophetic timelines follow a 300 and 60 day prophetic calendar. Now, this is Yah's divine design, and we're going to see that divine design as we proceed. His prophetic calendar of 360 days functions as a prophetic counting calendar. You know, I simply believe he wanted it to be simple for us. The days will be very hectic. We have hope because we know that Yahuwah has already told us everything that is going to be taking place. He has prepared our hearts and he has told us to start counting, to study his word, to guard his word, to feed on his manna. This prophetic 360 day Jubilee counting calendar does not incorporate a decufa or moon sightings or balancing days. However, make no mistakes, those have been incorporated in some 360 day calendars, such as the Enochian calendar and others. So the 360 day prophetic calendar has been incorporated in some calendars. The 360 day prophetic calendar works with anchor events and anchor dates. It's a timeline calendar. He's given us some anchor events and dates that I will review on a timeline so it will be easier to uh, relay it. And then the prophetic 360 day Jubilee counting calendar does serve as a check and balance and therefore can complement other biblical calendars. So we are still learning. There is, I was surprised at the amount of limited teachings on the 360 prophetic, the 360 day prophetic calendar. So keep that in mind. I am researching, I am studying, I am trying to hear and receive all that Yahuwah wants us to know about this 70th week that is about to unfold before the epic Jubilee comes. Let's continue with this clip. Greetings and welcome to the second half of part 10 in a series of videos on Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. In this session, we shall conclude our study of the issues involved in the 360-day versus solar or calendar year controversy. Our biblical search will lead us to a very definite conclusion as to which one is the true and faithful key to the prophecy. Other videos on the subject of the 70 Weeks Prophecy are at the YouTube channel Gavin Finley, and there are also a number of articles at the website endtimepilgrim.org. As we've seen, wrapped up in the seven verses of Scripture, that we've mentioned previously, someone is presenting us with a riddle. The seven verses all appear to be describing the latter half of the 70th week of Daniel. So we're being drawn into a puzzle. And what is it that this someone is showing us in these seven verses? And can we see it? If we approach the seven verses in faithful Berean or biblical fashion, we discover that when we do our homework, the riddle actually solves itself. The Bible is its own best interpreter. And then, wonder of wonders, the entire 70 weeks prophecy opens up to us. 
The clincher proving that God has delivered the 77s of years to us in units of 360-day biblical years is right there in front of us with those two verses, 6 and 14 of Revelation chapter 12. Both of them are describing the flight of the woman God's elect in the latter days. This wonderful image of the vision John saw is by Pat Marbanko Smith. Her gallery is at revelationillustrated.com. In Revelation 12, we see that at the close of the age, the covenant people of God are presented as the woman in travail. Being threatened by the dragon, she flies off to her place, a place of confinement where at the end of her exile, she will deliver the man-child. This image is by Pat Mavenko Smith. The unrefined covenant people, on their way to becoming the ultimate refined remnant Israel, are also presented in Scripture as Jacob. In Micah 2, 12 to 13, the prophet Micah hears God declare that he will gather all of Jacob as the sheep of the fold, the sheep of Bosra, which is in Edom. This would certainly be the time of Jacob's trouble. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus referred to his people as they came into the latter days as the elect, and this is in Matthew 24. The Apostle Paul spoke of the commonwealth of Israel in Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. So the Holy Spirit in Holy Scripture chooses to use different handles for God's covenant people in order to give us different perspectives on the unfolding story. In Revelation 12, 6, the time of the flight and exile of the woman is given to us as 1260 days. The matching description of the exile is given to us eight verses later in verse 14 of Revelation 12. We are told in this verse that the exile will last 3.5 years. So 3.5 years equals 1260 days. This is our second Rosetta Stone for biblical time. From this we get the biblical year, it's 360 days. This double reference we see in Revelation 12 is the main clue in our search for biblical or prophetic time. From this discovery, we solve the riddle of the seven verses. So here is the key we use to unlock prophetic or biblical time periods. And we can use it to successfully unlock the 70 weeks prophecy. We can also use the 360 day year to lay out the former 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. Our key introduces biblical years of 360 days and biblical months of 30 days. This true and genuine key of biblical time lines up all the tumblers. It aligns and unifies all seven verses to open the lock on the latter half of the 70th week of Daniel, the final 3.5 years of this age. Prophetic time is not only confirmed by Holy Scripture. It also comes to us as a divine revelation of beauty and truth, in the mathematics and geometry of a holy God. Was this 360-day year and 30-day month the original calendar describing the passages of the earth and the moon at the creation? Was this the clockwork of the solar system when God looked down on his handiwork and said that it was good? And were the orbits of the earth and moon disturbed at the cataclysms that came with the flood? The flood account in Genesis 7 and 8, where five months to the day are given to us as 150 days, points to that possibility. The flood account in Genesis gives us our first Rosetta Stone, as it were, for biblical time. There is nothing difficult, arcane, or obscure here. 150 divided by 5 is 30, so we do the math and then we believe what God is showing us. As we have seen, the 360-day biblical year, together with the 30-day biblical month, bring all seven verses into perfect unity and harmony as 1260 days. When we are open to the idea that God is issuing time to us, not according to this present natural order here below, but according to the perfection of his throne up above, and having received that, we then proceed on to do the math, everything just falls into place perfectly. So the 360-day biblical or prophetic year is fixed for us by the two time periods given to us for the exile of the woman of Revelation chapter 12. She is given the wings of a great eagle that she might fly away from the face of the dragon. Let's pause for a moment to reflect on this. The heavens were telling this awesome story long before the scriptures were written. The epic climax to this age is seen in the constellations of the stars. The lesser sheepfold is an ancient name for the Little Dipper. The pre-flood patriarchs knew about this end-time drama, and as they looked up into the night sky, they saw the magnificent deliverance by the Breaker, the Messiah, at the climax of the age. The heavens are telling the same awesome end time story in the constellation of Andromeda. Here the woman is chained to a rock on the seashore and threatened by a monster coming up from the sea. 
The image to the right is by 19th century artist Gustav Dorr, who has done a number of works on biblical themes. Uh, Saints, this is not mythology. God put these signs into the heavens before he laid the foundation of the earth. Adam and Enoch and the early patriarchs talk with God about these stories back in the pre-flood era. Long before the Bible was written, God's wonderful story of redemption and deliverance was pictured in the constellations and written in the names of the stars. But some will ask, is this time of the exile really three and a half years? What about the time times and the dividing of time that we see in Daniel 7.25? In these three times times passages, isn't God merely telling us that the time period is nothing more than three solar years and a portion, an uneven chunk of a solar year? Some will argue that the words dividing of a time we see translated for us in the King James Version for Daniel 7.25 indicates that this is not time times and a half a time at all, but an imprecise three years and a portion of a year. Without looking further into the matter, they jump to the conclusion that all three times times verses in Daniel and in the book of Revelation are similarly vague and imprecise. They will argue that these verses are not speaking of 3.5 years at all, but merely three solar years and a dividing a portion or a, a chunk of a solar year. They do this in order to try to make the solar year fit. Is this true? Well, let's take a look. Here is our first scripture, Daniel 7.25. Doing the word study on the Hebrew word translated in Daniel 7.25 as dividing of, we see it as the word pelag, Strong's word 6387. This map shows where the earth was divided, with parts of the earth's crust pushed up during the geographical cataclysm that happened in the post-flood days of Peleg. Peleg's name is related to the word Peleg. Peleg was named for the dividing of the earth that was seen in his lifetime. A related word, Peleg, strong 6386, is used to describe the feet on the image of Daniel chapter 2. The feet were divided into partly iron and partly miry clay. The word divide here means a portion or partition. It does not have to mean cut in half or into equal parts, although such a possibility is not precluded. So we can certainly agree that the time times and the dividing of time we see in Daniel 7.25 does not actually stipulate half. We should also know that this prophecy is cryptic. Daniel was told to seal up the book until the time of the end. Apparently this message was intended to be veiled until people worthy, concerned and responsible before God and to his covenant people came along and asked him for more specific information. So as the heavenly message starts to come to the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 7, we see the phrase dividing of time. And yes, this is certainly imprecise, but remember this was written during the reign of Belshazzar before the fall of Babylon. This was just the first of the three times times verses. Now we come to something interesting. At the end of the book of Daniel in chapter 12, we see that time has moved on and things are changing. Something happened here by another river. And now the prophet Daniel has been given an update to that earlier prophecy he received years before. In Daniel 12, 7, we see that the time, times, and the dividing of time prophecy we saw earlier in chapter 7, which related to the end time tribulation of the saints, is now reissued to us in more precise terms as time, times, and a half. Daniel receives the message and records the word spoken to him, but he is absolutely flabbergasted at what he hears. He does not understand it at all. How can the saints see their political and military power shattered and be given into the hand of the beast and then rise up victoriously to be given the kingdom at the end? Daniel is not given an answer to this conundrum. He is just told, Go thy way, Daniel. The words are closed up, sealed, until the time of the end. But the prophet Ezekiel, a contemporary of Daniel, receives an inspiring message which sheds some further light on this. It is the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. You can read this in Ezekiel 37. And this is another wonderful image by Gustav Dorr. Daniel is astounded at what he hears. Nevertheless, he gets the update. The time of the Great Tribulation is time, times, and a half. So to think of the three years and a chunk of a year is certainly an acceptable interpretation for the earlier passage in Daniel 7.25. But as we are now beginning to see, that was not the last word on the matter. It was just the beginning of the message. Here in Daniel 12.7 and later in Revelation 12.14, we get the rest of the story. These two verses, which follow on after Daniel's earlier vision in chapter 7, state the time period for us very precisely as time times and a half a time. In Daniel 12, at the end of the book, we see the word half is used, and it is the Hebrew word chetzi, Strong's 2677. This word does not mean dividing off, 
the word is faithfully rendered by the King James translators as half. So now we see an exact accounting of the time period. The Hebrew word chetzi occurs 125 times in the KJV. 108 of those times the word is translated very specifically as half. Here are some examples. Midnight has long been a time recognized as that discrete point in the middle of the night. And the watchmen going all the way back to ancient times knew that midnight was the point precisely halfway through the night watches. In the book of Ruth, we read that it was at midnight that Boaz became aware that the maiden Ruth was lying at his feet. And here in that passage from Ruth is the Hebrew word for midnight in its two parts, those being chetzi, meaning half or middle, Strong's 2677, and the Hebrew word layel, meaning night. In Exodus 25, we see the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant. The measurements are given to us in minute accuracy, down to half a cubit. We do not even think that there is anything vague or imprecise about the word half in this passage. It is 0.5 or 50%. This is the very same Hebrew word chetzi translated as half we see in the angel's message to Daniel in Daniel 12.7. You'll notice that the word half is very often and very specifically related to blood covenant matters between God and his people. We saw this right back at the beginning when Abraham made covenant with Yahweh God. On that occasion, animals were cut in half right down the middle. So at the end of the book of Daniel, the prophet is told in more specific terms about this coming time of trial. There has been an updating of the earlier message we first saw in Daniel 7.25. And now in Daniel 12, we are seeing that this time of great tribulation leading to the scattering of the power of the holy people is to last time times and a half a time, or 3.5 years. So why has this happened? What has changed between Daniel 7 and Daniel 12? Here is something for us to consider. When we come to the end of the book, Daniel is no longer under Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and the Babylonian powers. Daniel receives this new vision some years later, during the third year of Cyrus the Persian. Nearly 150 years before Cyrus was born, the prophet Isaiah foretold his birth, his very name, and the tasks that God had predetermined for him to accomplish, saying, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform my pleasure. And you can read about this in Isaiah 44, 28 through 45, 1. Cyrus had declared amnesty and freed the captives of Judah. He also showed them special favor as they returned home to resettle Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. So it is possible that the principalities and powers over the Persians may have been less inclined to limit the word of God coming down to Israel's agent, the prophet Daniel, as he served under the Persian rulers. Is there another reason to explain why the prophet Daniel has suddenly received this more specific and precise information? And the answer might surprise us because it's right there in the text. Daniel received the information because he asked. He was a man beloved of God. And why? Because he had been accountable and responsible before God for his own sins and for the sins of all his people. His concern was for the covenant people of God. They had been scattered and afflicted before and during his lifetime. Now he was hearing of what would befall them in the latter days. He was concerned, and he wanted to know more about this. The prophet Daniel had been told that God's people would be fully restored and would inherit the kingdom at the end. But he was also told that they would be facing unprecedented trials as they came up to the climax of the age. Daniel was asking for more accurate information concerning those future days. He was asking for this info on our behalf, and he got it. We have a third instance of this time, times prophecy. This time we find it near the end of the Bible, in the visions John saw in the book of Revelation. And our verse is in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. Here we see the phrase, time, times, and a half a time, and the word half is the Greek word hemesis, Strong's number G2255, and it means half. So now we have full and solid confirmation that the time, times, and a half a time as well as the earlier time times and a dividing of time in Daniel 7.25, are all referring to the same latter-day time period, a period of precisely 3.5 biblical years running up to the climax of this age. So we can be sure that the 360-day biblical year and the 30-day biblical month are both true and correct for the latter half of the 70th week. This is biblical or prophetic time. The 3.5 years are 3.5 biblical years of 360 days, and the 42 months are 42 biblical months of 30 days. All seven verses are speaking of 1260 days. These words in this message have been and continue to be sealed up to be sure, but only by a straight gate, the way of the cross. The principalities and powers and our own flesh all conspire to prevent us from finishing our pilgrimage and bringing in the end time witness. 
As we have seen, solving the puzzle is not all that difficult for those with a biblical worldview. Those who are wise, devoted to God, with a mindset open to the supernatural sovereignty of God will understand these things. Those committed to the witness of Messiah will make it a priority to search out, comprehend, receive, and to act on this message. Remember, too, that the Word of God and biblical truth does not come to us by intellectual effort or theological knowledge. Rather, God speaks to us by the Holy Spirit operating in and through the Holy Scriptures. God's Word is thereby revealed to us from His throne up in the third heaven, far above the gyrations and the noise of this present cosmos. As we have seen, this truth concerning biblical time confirms itself by turning the lock to open up the future 70th week of Daniel. So we can now proceed on to use the 360-day biblical year with confidence as our key to unlock the entire 70 weeks prophecy. When we do this for the former 69 sevens of years, that timeline as well falls into place with superb accuracy. So why is this study of the 70 weeks prophecy so important? The answer is simple. So we can have this chart into the future. We need to have it firmly fixed in our minds that there is a future 70th week of Daniel, the final seven years of this age. This is the final sabbatical for this present evil age, and it is up there in our future. It leads right on up to the jubilee year of the millennium of Messiah. And so let us remember our God and his word and our vital role of witness as we go up on stage or into the arena at the climax of this age. We simply cannot even think of skipping out early or abandoning ship to save our own skins like the crew tried to do in the shipwreck of the Apostle Paul. We have a job to do. And as with the Apostle Paul, God has given us the lives of all who sail with us. So let us keep our relationship with him as our top priority. And as we go about our business in this world and as we face our disappointments and our temptations to run away from the faith in our Messiah, let us always keep this in the back of our minds. We are on our way to a wedding feast. It also happens to be a victory feast. For those who have tasted the heavenly food, it's all there. And the wine, well, as we saw at Cana, the best wine is reserved until the last. The highway of holiness leads onwards and upwards towards the gates of glory. Grace and shalom to all the saints. Okay, so that, that presentation segment really confirmed our understanding how the 360-day prophetic calendar works with Bible prophecy. So now that's not to exclude us using annual calendars. Now, some of you may be on different annual biblical calendars. That doesn't exclude that. But when, when evaluating and determining prophetic timelines, then one must use Yahuwah's prophetic 360-day calendar. Now, the 70th week is the, will be the 10th Jubilee, and we need to understand more about Shemitah years, or sometimes they're re referred to as sabbatical years, and we probably really have um, neglected this area of study. So I just wanted to briefly review with some of these brief definitions I got from this standinfaith.org website. Shemitah years is the Sabbath every seventh year. So it's the, the seventh year is a sabbatical year. We read in Leviticus 25, verse two, three, and five, uh, when you enter the land that I am giving you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to Yahuwah. For six years, you may sow your field and prune your vineyard and gather its crops. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of complete rest for the land, a Sabbath to Yahuwah. The land must have a year of complete rest. So this is talking about a sabbatical year of rest. It's not talking about the Jubilee year right here, but it is talking about the Shemitah years every seventh year. Jubilee year is every 49 years. And then the 50th year is the 
Jubilee year. And we're going to show you how that works out on a Jubilee calendar. And we read, and you shall count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years so that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to 49 years. Then you are to sound the trumpet far and wide on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall sound it throughout your land. So you are to consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty in the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be your jubilee when each of you is to return to his property and to his clan. The 50th year in the 49 year Jubilee cycle. The Jubilee year cycle repeats every 49 years, seven Shemitahs, but the actual year of Jubilee is the 50th year. That is the 50th year is the same as, or it overlaps the first year in the next 49 year cycle. So here's the diagram to illustrate that overlap. And I was very excited to see how their pattern matched the pattern that we had put together and studied during our Daniel study. So you have seven years and seven times seven is 49. Same way in this upper example, seven years and seven down, and this is the 49th year. And then the first year of the next cycle is the 50th. So that is the pattern of the Jubilee, 49 years plus the next year of the next cycle equals the 50th, which is the Jubilee. Now, what I have found is, is people are getting confused with counting, counting every 50 years to determine the millennial cycle. So we have to keep that in mind that the millennial cycle is also important, but this is the Jubilee cycle. And we're, I'm gonna give some examples and we're going to practice how this is divinely put together. So the 50 year cycle, the 50 year cycle begins with the biblical creation in Genesis ending after 6,000 years on its 120th anniversary in in 2017, according to this website. After 6,000 years, the 120th anniversary of the 50 year, uh, 1917, 1967 and 2017 cycle coincides with the beginning of Daniel's 70th week in September, 2017. Now that's this particular website's viewpoint. So they're already <laughs> looking at their beginning of Daniel's 70th week. From our studies and from the anchor events we're looking for, we have not confirmed that the Daniel's 70th week has started. Hey, but we're open, right? We're, we're listening, we're watching and waiting. Now the 49 year cycle, in contrast, the Bible reckons the 49-year Jubilee cycle from when Israel entered the Promised Land in 1406 BC, ending on its 70th anniversary in 2024. The 70th anniversary of the 49-year Jubilee cycle coincides with the end of Daniel's 70th week in September 2024. So again, that's this particular website's point of view. It goes on to say coincidence, the 120th and 70th anniversaries of the two cycles are symbolically significant in themselves, but for them to frame the beginning and end of the 2017, 
2024 period is too auspicious to ignore or discount. And this website's author said, I cannot believe this is coincidental. So, so I'm mainly sharing this with you so you can be encouraged by we are finding the watchmen on the wall. We are finding those that are digging into his word and saying, you know, I want to understand the Jubilee cycles. I want to understand the 70th week prophecy. I want to be ready. I want to be that go-to person when people have their world turned upside down to help them be encouraged by even knowing what day it is. What is the count in the 2,520 day time period? Because that's encouraging. That, that tells a person how many more days they need to persevere. That tells the person what timeline they're in and what, what when will that timeline end? And that is why we are, that is why Yah brought these calendar, um, uh, this calendar information to the forefront. It was amazing. It was from him. Believe me, it was from him. <laughs> Absolutely, no doubt. So right here, it all started with me making a calendar based on a lot of the comments that Mr. Judadan had made under our very simplistic beginning of insights to this very possibility of the prophetic timelines being on a 360 day calendar. And so you'll notice here, if you even decide to make one yourself, is you just start with day one of the first day of the week and you make all of, you know, 30 days, because you make each month 30 days. And look at the beauty of this. It begins on Sunday, and this month ends on Monday. So Sunday, Monday, and then the next calendar starts on Tuesday, <laughs> and it ends on Wednesday, and the next month starts on Thursday. And so you see just the beauty of that in itself. So if this month ends on the 30th on a Monday, then the next month you have to fill in these five blocks here. So you start with those five here, just like you would on a normal calendar. You have to accommodate, you know, the, the differences between the months and so forth and so on. So you do that all the way through the seventh month. And then the seventh month, ends on a Shabbat, a Saturday. So what calendar would we need here? Because in the 30 day, 360, uh, the 30 day month, 360 day year calendar, these are all the months that you have. That's it. Th then they start repeating. So what calendar would we want? Well, if it ends on Shabbat, then we need Sunday next. And oh, here we go. That's what we need. We need a full week because this week is full. So that's exactly what we need here. So that would be the eighth month. And then it ends here on a Monday. So we need a, a Tuesday month. Oh, here it is. There it is. So, so there we go. And on this next month, well, we have three slots here. Oh, yep. It's going to be just like this one and so forth and so on. We have one left over here. So yep, we're gonna need that sample right there. So we just drop that in there and in the 12th month, there you go. That completes year one. And so year two would start with, there's four leftover blocks here. So we would um, start with this one right here. And that's how the months are made and that's the pattern. Then if we place 
those years, like we just made year one calendar and I have a reason for having those months lined out. So just bear with me. So we made one year, we just made one. That's it, it was simple. And then you, when you make the second year, you have to accommodate like those four little blocks here. You know, you have to start with those four days there and so forth and so on, just like making a calendar. But this calendar only has 30 days. So you, you make all the years accordingly. And then just like there was the repeat after the seventh month, and then it repeated the first month, repeated in this eighth month, same way with the years. So this um, yearly calendar repeats and matches this one. Okay, so the calendar format that we need in this eighth slot matches this one, because that's all the formats you're going to get with the 30 day calendar. And, um, and then it just continues. So what feast day will happen at the end of the last seven years? Through our study so far, we know that that is the day of atonement. So we have an anchor Moedim and so let's put it right here in the seventh month is when the Day of Atonement occurs. And the final Jubilee, this will be the last Day of Atonement. This will be the Day of Judgment on the 10th. And so how many days are in seven years with the 360 day calendar? We pretty much have gone over that several times. So it's simply, and like he reviewed in the uh, video excerpts, 12 times 30 day months equals 360 day year. Therefore, 360 day times seven years equals 2,520 days in seven years. That's, that's it. So to stay within our 2,520 days of the last seven years and knowing that the last seven years ends on the day of atonement so it ends here and i'm approaching this as the goal of to stay into the timeline that we're given from scripture to date i don't see where we can go beyond that timeline so that's my approach um, in those video sessions, he takes a different approach. But I'm having us, while we're learning, trying to stay within his 2,520 days, which covers seven years. So if it ends on the Day of Atonement, it appears it would need to start the day after the Day of Atonement in the very beginning. So if that's the case, then we would end up with 2,520 days. The first half, 1260, plus the latter half, 1260. So next, we, so we have the starting and the ending points. So with the starting and the ending points, we can identify the exact middle of the week, the midst of the week. And what's going to happen in the midst of the week? The agreement that signed with many is going to be broken. So we might want to calculate that. And, and Yahuwah has given us a very simplistic calendar so we can actually do that. <laughs> So in order to find the midst of the week, we simply have to start counting. So if we start here on the 11th, well, we have 20 days left over in this month. And we have one, two, three, four, five times 30 equals 150 plus 20 equals 170 days. 
Then from that, we add the next year, which would be 360 to that number, and we get 530 days. We add another 360 and we get 890 days. We add another 360 and we get 1,250 days. Well, we're 10 days short. So we have to add another 10 days on this month. So that would be the 10th day of the first month which is the day that the lamb without spot or blemish is chosen. And isn't that an interesting time for the midst of the week to be there? Because in the last seven days, we're going to see a great falling away. There's going to be many that are deceived and start worshiping the false Messiah. And they start thinking that the third temple that the false messiah is dwelling in is a good thing and they keep thinking that the resuming of the animal sacrifices is a good thing so just think about it in the midst of the week is the 10th day of the first month select choose choose your lamb what lamb are you going to choose that will be the decision we've made that decision because we are preparing ourselves for the last seven prophetic years, the 70th week of Daniel. We are preparing ourselves for people that are going to be falling away. They're going to be confused. And we need to walk alongside them and say, no, this way, this way. So now, we just need to continue our count until we get to the very end. So we have, we add 350 days because that 10 days went with this part. And we then add a full 360, we get 1970 days. We add another 360, we get 2330 days. And then we have a leftover of uh, 190 days and we have our complete 2,520 days to the Day of Atonement. So we also know that after that final day of judgment, then all the rehearsals we've been rehearsing for his Moedim, the Sukkot, when we tabernacle with him will actually come to fruition on the 15th day. But that was, will be when we are with our groom and, and being in his presence for the marriage supper of the lamb. So what was also interesting looking at this calendar and counting the days and finding the midst of the week being right here, the 10th day of the first month was that we also have a 1,290 day time period I want us to look at. So this is the midst of the week, falls on the 10th day, the time to choose the lamb that you are following, the lamb without spot or blemish, and many will be deceived. And our ultimate goal is to be with our groom at the marriage supper of the lamb. And that would be after the day of judgment, then we would be entering that 1000 year reign with Yahushua HaMashiach and awaiting the eighth great day So we have our midpoint. But speaking about that midpoint, personally, and, and as we go through the book of Revelation, we're going to have to make some tweaks along the way. I mean, and I'm not saying I have this all figured out. I'm not saying all that I'm presenting is 100% correct. I'm 
seeking, I'm searching, I'm putting out the graphics, I'm helping us come to the table and visualizing it and having a starting point. But personally, I would start the 1290 timeline from the beginning of this last seven year period. And if that's done, I, I pondered where would that end? Well, it would end 30 days beyond the first month. Then it would fall on the 10th day of the second month in which the lamb would be obtained to observe the Passover in the second month. And I don't know, I thought that was pretty cool if that's the way it turns out to be because, because there was a stipulation if people could not make the first Passover, then Yahuwah allowed for the second Passover. But observing the Passover and the bread and wine is not something you observe every week. It is once a year. And if you miss that first Passover, then it is allowed to observe it in that second month. And I thought that was interesting. So it would be right there. So now we have a tentative layout of the last seven years. As we go through the book of Revelation, we should note signs that represent a feast day of Yahuwah and see where it might land in association with our Jubilee prophetic counting calendar. So if I go back here, I think it's going to be very exciting as we study as we come across scriptures, as we see signs of, of specific elements that key us into what Moedim it is, see if we can coincide it with our 360-day prophetic calendar. So we have our weekly Sabbath. I think we're all solid on that. The seventh day is the Sabbath. That's the micro view, if you will. The sabbatical year that we looked at in the block of 49 years, that seventh column, that's our sabbatical year, or, or sometimes it's referred to as Shemitah year. That's like a macro, a bigger view of a larger Shabbat of rest, if you will. Now, this little red dot reminds us that's where we're at. That's exciting. That's very exciting. And we know Yah is with us. And we know he will never leave us or forsake us. So the sabbatical groupings of the millenniums some refer to them as grand, and that's a good description. And this uh, seventh millennium will be when we rule and reign with Yah Yahusha for a thousand years. Now, again, for the sabbatical, going back to this middle row, again, the sabbatical years, there's seven of them in one Jubilee cycle. However, when you go on to count that 50th year in the next cycle, if you're that that 50th year is the Jubilee. See what happens is in the 49th year, they blow the trumpets when they blow the trumpets on the day of atonement. So that gives the people five months to prepare for the Jubilee. So um, we have one, two, three, let's see. Um, well, five months and 20 days, okay? Because that's on the 10th of the seventh month. So we have, um, five months and 20 days. So what that does is it prepares the people 
to get all the arrangements made to enjoy that 50th year. So I hope that makes it clear. The trumpets are blown, everybody's notified, then there's a lot of work to be done to get everything sorted and everything. And then it's carried out at the beginning of the 50th year, which is also like we had another grouping of this, which is also the first year of the next cycle. So that's where you get, you could also connect that saying, the, the last will be first and the first will be last. Or you could also see that, that Jubilee year as being the Alpha and the Omega because Yahushua HaMashiach, he is our Jubilee. Now, some, and we've all heard of this, some have connected the Shemitah years every seven years. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen timelines like this. And, you know, according to Gavin Finley, he's not so sure that they should be tracked in, in those years since Yahusha. He does think it should be picked up on that last 70th week. And later on, I'll show you a different viewpoint from a man named Larry Wilson, who has unfortunately passed away last month, but I had come across his, uh, his website and he also had a YouTube channel that I gleaned insights from. So the reason why I'm showing you this timeline is that sometimes the enemy can, well, sometimes, yeah, most certainly the enemy mirrors and counterfeits everything. So I thought this was interesting how it showed financial crisis, oil shock, hard recession, stock, stock market crash, bond market crash, stock market, and so forth, so on, so forth, mega crash alert in 2015. Why I'm showing you this is that, I don't know, could the enemy be saying, look, we're putting it on a calendar for them. I wonder if they can even figure that out. I don't know. Are they mocking us? I don't know. But we might ought to be uh, very leery of 2022 based on what this viewpoint is showing. But I'm not saying that to be or not to be. I'm just kind of making that observation. So who knows if the enemy could be planning for a financial reset or not, it's hard to say. Now, Libby, do we really need to know all this? Do, yeah, I think we do. And, and it's unfortunate that we didn't see this before, but for whatever reason, Yahuwah has kind of shaken us up to look at this and we're seeing the beauty of his 360 day prophetic calendar. And, and we're understanding why we are practicing our Moedim and practicing our counting and, and understanding the calendar and when to start the annual year and trying to be in sync with the heavenly realm. And we know that the first month we have the selection of the lamb, and then we observe Passover on the 14th. And then we, ha we have the counting of the weeks, right? And we count, sometimes it's referred to as counting of the Omer. And we count seven full weeks. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the seventh one ends up here. Well, that's 49 days. And then the 50th is on the day of Pentecost. So in this example, we see the Feast of Weeks are sometimes referred to as counting of the Omer, begin on the first day of the week, Sunday, 
and ends on the 50th day, a Sunday, which is always the case, starts and end on Sunday. All right, so we've been doing this. Most of us have been, we've learned this. We've, we've learned how to count the Omer. And if not, this year would be a great year to start learning. And we're here to help one another understand this. So there's no dumb questions. We've all been there and we've all had to learn from the very beginning. Now, now let's compare what we just saw to the same pattern in the Jubilee cycle. All right, so it's, if we put the days of the week above it, it's going to make it look more familiar to you as a regular calendar, okay? So it's not going to be as scary, if you will. And it's, and so it's going to start on this first year, which we call, we'll call the Sunday year or the first year column. And it's going to end on the first of the next year, the next Jubilee cycle, which would be the 50th. So we count seven years each. So we have one set of seven, and that's why over here I have year one of the sevens, year two of sevens, year three of sevens, and so forth. So we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then we have the 50th. So, so <laughs> y'all use this micro view of counting of the Feast of Weeks to help us understand and not make it so scary to understand the Jubilee cycle. It's the same. And we see, we see that just like the above example with the fourth day of the third month being Pentecost, we see it is also Sunday. So you have a, a double meaning for this day. It is on the first day of the week, Sunday, but it's also Pentecost. It's also marked as Pentecost. And here the Jubilee cycle does likewise. The Jubilee is the 50th year, but it is also the first Sunday year or the first year of the first column or the first year of year one of the seven. So again, it's, it's an, a work of art to, um, that he has created for us to, to glean from and understand. So for those that have utilized our Jubilee counting chart, because and some of you may not be as familiar with it, but we that that seven year time frame that we just looked at, we are contemplating, if you will, that that Abraham Accord agreement that was signed possibly could be that agreement of Daniel nine twenty seven. So. We placed it on day 11 after the Day of Atonement in that in last year, 2020, and started counting. And just for people's information, we're on the 142nd day of the 360 day prophetic calendar of the first year of sevens, if it pans out. I don't know if it's going to pan out, but that's that's the counting number we're on, number 142. And we understand that the prophecies in his word follow the 360-day year with 30-day months. We know this because of the numeric timelines of 42 months, 1,260 days, or three and a half years, which are divisible by 30. We can simply start counting based on markers that align with anchor events like the Daniel 9.24 or 9.27 about the signing of the agreement to keep his people and his feasts synchronized. And it's very simplistic. He, he kept it simple for us to, to help us keep track 
in a very non-technical way because we know Yahuwah moves and acts on his feast days. And is it possible he's using these, this um, 360 day prophetic calendar to, to, to position his last seven years to help his people be synchronized with the Moedim from the heavenlies and on earth to, to have those calendars People uh, follow various annual calendars, but as the prophecy starts to unfold, if, if we follow his prophetic 360-day calendar, it would have us coincide and be synchronized with the heavenlies. That is what I'm seeing to date, and that's what I'm sharing, because he moves and acts on his feast days. Um, so therefore, in our present, I mean, our counting exercise, if you want to call it that, we are observing the signing of the Abraham Accord as the quote unquote possible agreement with many in Daniel 9.27. If we don't see more validating events by this coming Passover or the second Passover, like if we're not seeing animal sacrifices take place on a special altar, then we will just scratch it and um, continue to watch and observe for yet another possible signing of an agreement with many. Or we'll look at um, different um, prophetic dates and events that may be unfolding. So we would just continue to watch and observe so next week, we are going to start with another awesome clip that is going to pull what we just looked at with the Jubilee cycles and the calendar and how, how it's so divinely put together and how it blends with the counting of the Omer. And he gives us the bigger picture and he's, he's had his bride rehearse we get it, we understand it, and if we don't, we're going to look at it some more, and we are going to get it. That's so exciting to see every jot and tittle. It's just like his signature, so praise y'all, and I hope you're as excited about this as I am, and so next week, we're going to start with another excerpt by Gavin Finley, and he gets more into the Jubilee cycles and the pattern and stuff. And I was so excited. I was just so excited to run across his, his YouTube channel and his website because sadly, when I did discover um, uh, Larry Wilson and try to make contact and matter of fact, I ordered some of his his um, materials and stuff. And I was very sad to hear he had passed away because these are pioneers. These, these teachers are pioneers. They, they are um, pathfinders, if you will, or trailblazers, if you wanna call them. But I want to reach out and glean from them. And also next week, I'm going to bring to the table different watchmen on the wall that have done exorbitant amount of work on, on, on taking his word and, and charting it and doing the math and so forth and so on. But honestly, some of these people are way beyond my mathematical comprehension. <laughs> so praise Yah. He's given us a beautiful 360 day prophetic calendar. And we're going to see how some have tied it in to the annual calendar using the, um, the spring equinox and, and then putting in some intercalary days and seeing how it can also be shaped and formed into an annual calendar. We're, we're going to see people that use the moon. We're going to see people that use the sun. 
And we're also going to see how these various calculations can also come very close to one another. But the main thing is that, that we are going to focus on the book of Revelation. We're going to look at the last seven years and we're going to familiarize ourselves with keeping it simple, understanding how to count the last seven prophetic years. And we'll see where y'all lead. So this concludes part one of Revelation introduction. We'll complete the introduction next week. So I'm going to stop share and I see we have a couple of hands raised and we'll um, see where that leads us. Okay, Daoud, you have your hand raised. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation. You brought forth a lot of wonderful information tonight. Uh, one of the things that really caught my attention was the midst of the week uh, falling out on the 10th day of the first month. And I want to read a scripture and see if you can make a connection with this. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. <laughs> now, in light of what you... Yeah. I think, I think you got it. Yeah, I, I got, got it. it. <laughs> Okay, so I had always wondered about that, that verse, and I knew that there was more to it than just a simple ink on the page uh, rendering of it. And then I, I got to thinking about uh, your, some of your last comments about we're going to see things from uh, people of all walks of calendars, specifically yeah. the, the yeah. lunar calendars. Yeah. Now, this year... Yeah. 2021 is a mere year of Joshua, the Joshua Passover event. All right, we're going to have our Passover. If you're on the covenant calendar, it's going to be on the 3rd of April, which will be on the uh, uh, Sabbath. Uh, not on the 3rd of April on, on that Gregorian calendar, but on the covenant calendar, it will be on a Sabbath, just as it was with, with Joshua. One of the things that... Uh, uh, Yahuwah has had me studying is this Joshua event and how it pertains to our time today. You know, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Jericho is moon city. Jericho is moon worship. So I'm seeing today that the, the people that are on the lunar calendar are in a 13th month this year, which puts them a month behind us. And then you talk about the second Passover event is for those who are on a journey, all right? So all these things are coming together that it could be possibly this year or seven years from now that we'll see this, uh, a fullness of this come to take place. Uh, you understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. That yeah. The, 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 the anticipated 50th Jubilee either this year or seven years from now. Could this, either way, it's going to be a kickoff event this Passover. <laughs> Very well I'm could saying. be, absolutely. And um, that's, you know, I have so many other watchmen on the wall though that's going to show that to be so. And I want us to, to, to just consider their work and where they're at, just to see how close people are coming together on these years. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, just a window, which <laughs> if, if, makes my eyes get really big. If I could share with you just a, a couple other little tidbits that I think you, uh, tidbits that you, who is showing me on this, Absolutely. the events that are recorded with Jericho, the Joshua fighting the battle of Jericho and the slain with the edge of the sword is a picture of uh, the Israelites, uh, a spiritual picture for our time now, the Israelites going in 
and converting these people and bringing them the truth, uh, the truth, and dashing to pieces their their false doctrines and their false belief. When I break down the words of edge of the sword, it means to slay with the words of Yahuwah. All right. So I think we're going to see the spiritual prophetic implications of that when Yahuwah brings down the walls again around all these fake, all these calendars that are not in as he tells us in scriptures, teach us to number our days that our hearts arrive to wisdom. So that's what I see that is going on. The Joshua Jericho event was a prophetic picture of what we can expect in these latter days. Very good. Very good, Dawood. Thank you. Yes, and, and it seems like some of the previous generations use the moon a lot to with their annual calendars and um and then i've also come across all these automated calculations of all these various calendars so it's it's very interesting I, and next week i'm not going to spend a lot of time on it but i just want to show some of the di diverse angles and and the work that people have done and how, in a way, they, they are coming very close to similar time periods. Okay, um, Betty. I was, I was just going to speak to the event that, um, that we're watching for to start our counting. And I thought it was rather interesting because uh, President Trump, uh, past President Trump, has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And that was one of the items that in the list of things that was brought forward was the Abrahamic Accords, the fact that he initiated the signing of it. And so, you know, before that issue could have maybe like gone under the radar, hardly anybody knew about it, but being brought forward in that format brings a little more attention to it. So I just thought it was kind of yeah, that is interesting. And also, I believe he, he was one of the presidents that never got us into any war. <laughs> so, okay, April. I think it was back on screen 27. I couldn't really see it very well, but um, maybe you could tell me. <clears throat> I read the book from Jonathan Kahn several years ago on the Shemitah. At the end of each seven years, the economy would always uh, falter greatly. Did you find in those years that you had listed that it was the end of the Shemitah year where you had crash, crash, crash? Did you yeah, find that at was. the end? And here uh, we are at the like a mega crash <laughs> reset. Um, and everybody I'm listening to is saying it's soon, it's soon, it's soon. So. If it makes it till the beginning of the new year, uh, the new Tekufa for the spring, are we looking at the same time frame that Dawid's has um, suggested and Betty has suggested? Because it seems like a mega thing is coming this year, this coming new year. Is that what you're seeing when you study? Well. There had to be a reason I came across that one little chart, April, and there has to be a reason why I chose to include it, even though um, uh, Gavin Finley um, doesn't put much weight into that. I was thinking possibly the enemy does. And so um, it, could, it could be. And if it, if it was following that chart, which I'm not even sure if that chart's correct, um, it would be looking at 2022. But we have, um, we do know from prophecy that we, there should be an economic collapse. They're working rather hard to make that happen, it, it appears, <laughs> right? Right. You know, Jonathan Kahn, I heard somebody else say this and it really put a seed in my mind. Uh, is that name really true? I mean, con, is it conning us, <laughs> you know? And I thought about that a lot. And, you know, they have to telegraph to us 
what they're going to do. Right. That's their, they have to do that according to Yahuwah. They have to tell us. So um, I'm just wondering how many things do they have to sign for us that we get it? Anyway, that's my thoughts. I don't know if anybody else is thinking that way, but I'm sure kind of leaning that direction. So thank you. Absolutely. Fantastic study. Thank you. Well, good, April. And absolutely, you know, at first I was um, taken in with, with the insights that Jonathan Kahn did, but after he headed up that return to um, Jesus right before the obelisk in Washington, D.C., and how that was advertised and the sim symbolism in that, bowing down, getting innocent believers to go and believe that's who they were worshiping and bowing down before an obelisk. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't follow any of his stuff anymore. And, and I do find that name to be very interesting. And it could be the enemy mocking uh, us. And, and only Yahuwah knows the heart. I'll leave him to Yahuwah. And, um, but for now, I have, yeah, <laughs> I've turned away from that kind of teaching for sure. And I try to warn people about it when I can. Yeah. Okay, thank you, April Daoud. Yeah, on the... On the seven years of uh, financial disturbance that you showed on that one chart, that fits in with something that's going on currently now too. I don't know if, if uh, all the viewers and listeners tonight are familiar with N Nasara and Jasara. Has anybody heard those terms? Yeah, I've those? heard those terms, but I couldn't tell you anything about them. Those are... Uh, pools of money, if you will, that the world uh, financial elite have uh, plans to uh, get everybody on that will, what they're going to do, the, uh, NASARA stands for the national uh, form of this uh, money, and it's uh, designed to get everybody on the nation to sign on to it, and it's going to do away with, uh, I'll cancel out all debts, mortgages, things like that, okay? And then the, the SARA is a global uh, picture of the same thing. So this is already in the works, and this, to me, when I see it, smacks of a counterfeit jubilee. That uh, that Satan's and you tie that together with the seven years that you sh showed on that slide of financial uh, turmoil that we've gone through. You know, it it just all seems to tie together that again Satan is counterfeiting, using the our, our scripture book as his template. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And even seeing that they have a great reset plan as well. So yeah. the, the beast man is rising, Esau is rising, and the one new man, Israel, is rising. It's good against evil. And, and Yahweh's people are going to be, uh, have the Ruach Kakadesh poured out on them. And the two witnesses are going to be formidable foes and the 144,000 are going to be formidable foes. And otherwise Satan wouldn't have to fight with them. He just kind of slough them off, but no, there's going to be war and they're going to be powerful. And some from, from my studies, from what I've seen, some, it seemed to, they seem to clump the two witnesses and the 144,000 together and almost during the same time period where I don't take that approach. I, I put the two witnesses in the first half, if you will, and I put the 144,000 in the latter half witnessing to those going through the great tribulation. I may be wrong, but you know, there's different points of view on that. We will How do the, um, I'm sorry, I should have put up my hand. 
That's okay. How do you think? Oh, how do the Jehovah's Witnesses think that, that they're part of the 144,000? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know much about them. <laughs> so, I don't know. But Yahweh knows who his 144,000 are. So, mm. uh, Bill, you sure are quiet tonight. That's not like you. <laughs> You're mute. Well, I was just waiting for my moment to make a lot of noise. <laughs> um, you know, this is new for me. And, I, and so I have to, I'm going to play the opposite side. Can I do that? Oh, sure. Okay. I always thought that the Shemitah and the Jubilees were land covenant ordinances. Am I right? Well, the it's it's land rest and and land return to previous owners and stuff. It has a lot to do with the land and setting the captives free and and it has some financial aspects to it, but it's definitely land connected as well. Absolutely. Okay. And so that's why I've um, I've never looked at jubilees or those kinds of thoughts it was because they were land agreements. Um, and but but he's going to be returning us to his land, right? Mount Zion, right? This is absolutely true. This is absolutely true. Um, and, and um, so, so that, that's why I never went this route. And so I find it, I find it new to me, right? To think in that kind of um, a concept while we are dispersed, right? And that's really, right? Yeah. Um, and and um, the book of Joel, I don't know. It's extremely prophetic. It really does relate a lot to Revelation. Have Have you read that or, or yes. considered that? Oh, absolutely. It's a big prophetic book. Are you going to introduce that as we go along? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and Zechariah, I think, are also right up the same vein, right? Right. Right. I hope to I hope we do bring those books in. Uh, Bill, they have a lot of uh, impact. And uh, before we move on to Joel, I, I'd like to say one other thing about what you were saying about the Jubilees, because I thought it was very interesting how Gavin Finley um, viewed from the time of Yahusha's crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection to what he views to be the 70th week in the end of days he 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 advocates that 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 2000 time period isn't observing the jubilee cycles that's that's what he was saying and i don't know if you picked up on that or not but i've looked at his little excerpts you know a couple of times trying to get it ready for this session tonight so so we know that Yahushua was born under the book of the law. So the Jubilee cycles and like even Larry Wilson was saying he felt that, and I think uh, Deanna had said this, I don't think she's on tonight, but I think she had said, well, the, the Jubilee cycles may have started on the Exodus. And, and that was an interesting perspective. And then as I've been kind of gleaning information, trying to understand this, that very well may be the case. It may, the Jubilee cycle may have, now we know the Shabbat, the, the Sabbath started at the very beginning on the seventh day he rested, but these are things we need to contemplate. When did it begin? And does it, does it begin from the beginning of time to the very end of time? There seems to be two tracks. One track 
some people just counting the 50 years and multiplying and getting the millenniums, that seems to be one track. It's more of a time period line from the beginning of creation to the end of time. And then parallel to that, if you will, it seems like then you have the, the Jubilee cycle. And, and did it start on Exodus? And did it go up through to the time of Yahushua HaMashiach at the 483rd year? And, and I liked how Gavin stated it, you know, because I understand not everybody believes in that gap. Personally, I do. I, I, I track with that more than just continuing that 70th week and it being with Stephen. No, he was cut off. So that justifies a, a break. That justifies a gap until he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in that 70th week. So, so it seems that it might be feasible, Bill, from what, and I've never contemplated it before, just came across this guy 24 hours ago, you know, and I never thought about that. So it's possible that those 2000 years didn't really, even though we may want to track it and be aware of it, it may not have any, um, it may not be applied to that time period. Yet, next week, we'll see where Larry Wilson saw it a little differently and i'll show show you all that but but right now i think i think um gavin finley has something going on there and it kind of coincides bill with what you you were saying which was which was you know you really didn't really look at it that seriously because you didn't think it was still applicable to our day and it very well may not have been. No, you know, I think that's I think that's where the idea separates. I could not prove time periods. Because if we look at the birth of Yahusha, when was it? Could have been anywhere within a seven year period, they say. Mm -hmm. The um, the fall of of. Um, of, Ju of Judah and, and the destroying of the temple also has a discrepancy of time periods. The lineage that's spoken of in Genesis 8 has time period separations. Yeah. And, and when I ran into that difficulty, I had to ask myself the question, Am I going to try and look for Waldo, so to speak, um, in time periods? And I don't think I could. And because I couldn't come to, and because I couldn't come to a specific, I had to let it go. Because even though I believe in what you're saying, um, I think that we need the other side of the page in order to reset the dates, to make confirmations. But as long as we're looking at dates, we can't confirm them because they don't, they don't have any consistency. And so that's kind of why I let it go. Well, I'm gonna introduce you to some um, sites next week that are very, very interesting, Bill. I mean, we may just be scratching the surface and I surely don't have all the answers, but um, in preparing what I came across was we need to understand about inclusive counting because when inclusive counting is applied, they, they didn't do any fragments of years. If, if, if someone, something took place in just a portion of, e of one year, they counted it as a whole year. And so um, Larry, I think it's Larry Wilson did a lot of work on that. He showed this, this count and then he'd show 
Well, this is <coughs> it would be if you applied inclusive counting. And so that, that's a whole nother, another realm. <laughs> and personally, I didn't feel like going down that path because my goal is I want to keep it simple. Right. And, um, and, you know, I, I, wanna, I do want to qualify with everyone listening that my objective is not to dispute what you're saying, right? It really isn't. Um, my, my, it was just points of my particular view of why I never went down that road. So yeah, I'm a little bit quiet because I'm trying to absorb as much as I can and I can't wait until I watch it again, um, right? Because as you're speaking and as others are speaking, they'll say something, your mind will go off, you'll come back three sentences later. And so you miss stuff, right? And, yeah. and I found myself looking for the reverse key on, uh, you can on a live stream. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so poor me, I'll have to wait. Um, and so, you know, that, that's the, um, that's kind of the, the reason why I never went there. And the other thing is, is that when I, when I think of Revelation, I think of it as a separate book. And I, I really have to say that the book itself now has to interpret itself. And, you know, when we talk about Revelation, I think you said it right in the beginning, that it's kind of weird that all of a sudden we run into immediate symbolisms, right? You know, and it's like, wow, we're all of a sudden now we're into symbolisms. That didn't make it easy. How do you unveil something? Just get, you're right. It's like a double box before you find the prize. Um, so, so yeah. um, it, it, for me, I'm, I'm still um, coming up with an approach on how to understand it better, on how to allow the words that are being spoken in the, in the, in the book speak, right? It's like everyone says the seven churches, right? But there's eight, right? There's okay. actually eight. Oh, I well, didn't. I, the Nicolaitans I missed, was I missed church. number eight then. <laughs> yeah, Nic well, they meant he, uh, it's mentioned twice. The, the, the Nicolaitans was actually a church okay. that allowed profanity of Yahweh's word, right, um, for their members. Right. And so they're alluded to, but they're not recognized. And, th and that's kind of one of the things that I found in there. I also found that, yeah, the book was written to the saints or was it written to the servants? Right. And so it was written to the saints, right, of John or, or to the servants of John and to John the servant to be given to the saints and to the angels. And so this is the kind of thing that I went. So this is great for me. I really, um, I come to understand a little bit more of how you've been describing the, the calendar and how it works, right? Mm -hmm. And- are you, uh, are you familiar with the Torah? Which one do you mean? The law, the writings, or the, the instructions? Because that all Torah means all three of those, maybe four more. Oh, anyway, I was good. I, I was going to make a comment here. I mean, Revelation is of the New Testament, okay? And uh, I've got a comment I want to just bring forth that the New Testament must be compared and be in harmony with the Torah. And be tested with the Torah. I don't know what anybody else would think of this. But anyway. No, I think you're right. And I think we all agree. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Kathleen. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that's how, that's why and how we will be able to understand some of this symbolism is by knowing the yeah. front of the book. And Bingo. yeah. I know uh, Walter brought this comment to yeah to me and uh, I thought I'd, I, I never thought about that aspect of uh, comparing, you know, with the Torah, the New Testament. So, you know, the first five books. So, but anyway. Yeah. No, no, that's great. As a matter of fact, what, as I was mentioning to Libby, uh, to everybody actually, um, 
in, in some of our sessions is that I basically studied the Tanakh, right? Because we can go back and we can go into the ancient Hebrew and under and, and gain understandings through the, the Hebrew language. As long, as long as it's not the Talmud, because that's man-made. No, I only deal with the, the scriptures. Yeah. Um, yeah. Talmud was a, yeah. And, and so I found that when I started reading the New Testament, a lot of the words and a lot of the, the, the phrasings were out of the Old Testament. So, um, you know, the new equals or is affirmed by the old and the old, you know, interprets or, or gives uh, light to the, to the new. Uh, I agree. I agree. And, and, you know, so we do see a lot of the imagery of, like you said, the, what was written in the five books of Moses, right? Mm -hmm. Or the five writings of Moses. So we do right. see that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and so that's what I was kind of alluding to is that the imagery was imagery that the servants of Yahusha would understand. Right. Absolutely. It has a strong connection to the old Testament. You, you know, the, the understanding, the tribes, understand the, the encampments, understanding the lead banner of the, the four quadrants of the encampments, understanding the, the seven churches or possibly eight assemblies that when John the Revelator, I mean, um, yeah, John the Revelator is, is released from Patmos, that he goes and connects with those actual congregations and that reach through time to us. So there's so, yeah, it's all, it's all connected. And, and it's, it's going to lead us back to uh, Yahusha. It's going to lead us back through the door that's open in Revelation 4.1. It's going to, we're going to enter in through that door that he opened that once was the partition of separation that separated Adam and Eve from the garden away from the tree of life. Now that door is open and, and we'll be able to return to the beauty of, of the garden of Eden and his Fellowship presence. With Yahweh. Yes, absolutely. Right. And, and, you know, Bill, you were saying how the words in, in the, in his in the book of revelation and elsewhere but also what i'm finding is that all these numbers all these numerical values oh man apparently they have a lot of hidden meaning behind them and some have even used the mathematical calculations to create beautiful fractal images which i had never even heard that they could even be formed and mm. and so anyway that's way beyond uh, my understanding but we lit we are huh, we can't imagine you know his realm him being in another realm beyond our three-dimensional realm it's going to be fabulous it's going to be undescribable and his his angelic council they're brilliant they're very very smart and they're very patient with us <laughs> because you know we have a lot to learn but they're very patient with us so i look forward to seeing what what we um discover and yes, I, I Joy, do. I do have a further comment, but I do see that Joyce was was up and. Okay, we'll come back to you, Bill. Yes, Joyce. <laughs> Thank you, William. Is it William or, or Bill? You can call me Bill now that we're family. Bill. Bill. Oh, okay. <laughs> great, great. Oh, well, me too. I, I'm a new. Uh, um, I'm a new follower, of Yeshua. And the first three uh, year, I was listening uh, with the MP3 while I was truck driving because I'm, 
I'm an old uh, truck driver. I drive for 20 years. Transport? And yes, transport uh, wow. from across Canada and US and the States. And That's awesome. Yeah, well, I learn a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I come to uh, understand how much uh, Yahweh loved me a lot also. But what I want to say is the language we, we can learn in when we read the Bible, it explains itself. Like you said before, baby, you're going to find the answer in another book or you're going to find it that's right yeah and when you start to study the hebrew language with the even even the greek you you have a lot of things come up to light also and i want to say that i'm following a covenant calendar uh, club and club means a group of people who's gathered together to search and discuss some matters that's not a a crazy thing i think it's awesome thing mm -hmm. and i just finished a powerpoint uh, lately regarding the the calendar and everywhere everything uh concerning yeshua is pointing to a timeline. And I realized that tonight. So when he come to when he came to restore, I believe he came to restore the time timeline. Yeah. So what we are working tonight with you, Lady, yeah, I think it's awesome. I thank you very much for your work, your dedication. And I love to be with you uh, once in a while when I can. And I appreciate it greatly. And I apologize for my English. I get sometimes better, sometimes worse, but uh, I think it's awesome. Well, thank and you. I, yeah. And I need to study a little bit more myself. And you encourage me to do so. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good. Yes, this last seven years are, are going to be very unique, very unique. And we're all learning together. Um, and I don't have it all figured out, but I'm excited to see where he's leading us. And he's the one that got us on this track. So um, it's important to him for sure. And um and I just wanted to share with you that um, when I was still in the traditional church, Joyce, Yahweh laid it on my heart to initiate a trucker's ministry. Um, the church was right next to Procter & Gamble, and they did not have facilities for the truckers. And, and so if they had to wait on a load, it, they were just up the creek and and you know I had heard people say stuff like other people were saying well we should do something for the truckers you know but nobody ever did anything and Yahweh put it on my heart to to well we just need to do it you know and one day I went and got a shovel and threw it in the back of the truck and Ruth said well, what are you doing I said well I'm going to go up to the church and I'm going to level out an area where they can put a porta john out there so at least the truckers can have a facility without having to go across the street or whatever, you know, and so that's where it started. And, um, and from that point on, you know, when Yahuwah lays something on your heart, you don't, you don't know how it's going to come about. Um, I started gathering little um, notions and stuff that truckers might want and the first day we just set up a picnic table out underneath the trees and and didn't even know if the truckers would come out to get a McDonald's biscuit and a cup of coffee but that first day we had seven and then 
of course, Bruce had to go to Africa the, the next month. And then I was out there by myself and my sister was leading our Sunday school class. And I was sitting on a tailgate of a truck with coffee and biscuits. And from there, we created a whole rest area. We Y'all provided prisoners to clean up that road. It was just in disarray. The railroad track ran by there. There was all kinds of uh, saplings and stuff. And we got skid steers out there. Y'all provided all the heavy equipment. We landscaped it. We put concrete picnic tables. We been built a cabin with, with two showers and a washer and dryer and free food and two computer stations and a TV station. And, um, and yeah, y'all blessed. And, and, and so th that's how, you know, how y'all pulls me into certain um, callings, if you will. The trucker ministry, also that one time when uh, Dr. Dino, um, Kent Hoven, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He was uh, in prison. He was really uh, given an exorbitant amount of sentencing and really <sighs> ended up in a bad situation. But, but God calls us and I can testify to all of you that toward the end of Daniel, Yah was speaking very loudly to me that he wanted us to look at this start counting and and um you know I, I shared a very bizarre story about that 50 foot of pipe getting that from home depot <laughs> and um and it took off from that point but Yah talks to us in several ways and he is most definitely getting us ready and trying to help us connect to him and understand this prophetic last seven years. So I have a great respect for truckers. My dad even did some trucking um, in his latter years. He was a uh, ag pilot most of his life though. So I uh, really appreciate our truckers. They have kept our economy and everything moving in North America, and we owe so much to them. And it's a tough, tough thing to be on the road so much. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go off on too much of a testimony there, but um, those are precious times to me because that's when I saw y'all really working and calling us to um, be there for others. Well, you're a good servant. <laughs> well I just uh, I say yes to him I'll, I'll put it that way if if I get a clear message from him I'll, I'll you know I say yes and uh, so and then he blesses he takes it from there okay well I know it's getting late on that east coast and people are probably getting tired and everything so we'll pick up next week and we'll see where y'all lead. So I'm so th glad y'all could join, okay? I hope so. I even found my mic here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got it all figured out now, Kathleen. <laughs> yeah, all I had to do is push it and there they are. <laughs> yeah, Donna's so good with that. I mean, she's our tech go-to, you know, all those details. Yeah, usually they, they stay there, eh, on, on, on uh, the computer, but this, it, it goes, but you got to push it, and then it, they come up, you know, <laughs> that's the way this tablet is, it's just a, it's, it's a, um, oh, I forget what the name of it is, the name of the, the computer, Nova. yeah, yeah, right. I have one. You do? Yeah, it's an older really? one, but I, I, I like it a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have to exper experiment with it here for a bit. Sure, and there's your name right now. Lenovo Tab. Pardon? You have Lenovo Tab MTED FHD Plus showing as your name on Zoom right now. 
I think that happened when you got kicked off and you logged back in. It, it kicked off your Kathleen name and it has Lenovo on it now. <laughs> Maybe that's because you yeah, our, our, son was, uh, our son was concerned that uh, we weren't, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi type of thing, you know, so uh, we had to make sure of that. And uh, otherwise, you know, it gets to be expensive type of thing. <clears throat> Probably yeah. because you didn't log into Zoom on your tablet, on your, on that computer. What's that? It's probably because you didn't log into your Zoom account on that computer. Oh, okay. Anyway, it's taken care of. <laughs> okay. Well, y'all have a good I evening. Hope what, Kathleen? I just hope you. I hope. I just hope you didn't hear some too much of your uh, ear sounds from me that uh, were uh, uh, oh. weren't obnoxious or something or whatever. <laughs> no, not at all. Everything was good. Everything was real good. <laughs> I know Viv came on, but anyway, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that Vivian, you got to watch her. <laughs> <laughs> well, you still didn't mute your mic, Kathleen. It's still open. <laughs> Quiet. I opened it myself. <laughs> but I know how to shut it down, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Vivian, thanks well, very much for your teaching. I appreciate it. Okay. That. All right. You're, Shalom, you're everybody. Very welcome, Hello, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, Megan. Good night, Good night. Good night. Vivian, Donna. Good night. Thank you, Jason. It's always good to see you. Good night. You too.